Welcome to the Lewis and Kyle show. I think we're going to have a lot of fun chatting today. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, this is a kind of out there question for the listeners, but I heard that you have plans to potentially be the first person to do LSD in zero gravity. I was at least re in recorded internet history. Uh, I am the first person that I could find online or in any sort of documents. Uh, nobody has claimed that they experienced zero gravity on LSD. And so I did it. Uh, and it was the most transcendental high, but just transcendental life experience. Experience as someone that grew up wanting to be an astronaut, I just, it will forever be seared into my memory. The sensation of it, I obviously did not go into a spaceship. I was on a zero gravity plane. So we were doing our first parabola and going up, and then we were, we were dropping, and I, I'm lying on the floor of the plane. And as I first, began to experience weightlessness, I was just so overwhelmed. I And I had taken the same LSD a week before to time it. So I was like peaking right when this happened. I mean, this was, it, it was a very well done undertaking and peaking on the acid. And I am having this just extraordinary visceral out-of-body experience because I had spent countless hours of my life imagining what it would be like to float in, in space, like to, 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 to have no gravity around me. I wanted to be an astronaut and here I was and I just found myself with tears not rolling down my face, but rolling off my face and floating in front of me. And it was, I was just, I was in Valhalla. It was incredible. That's so, that's an amazing story. I'm like just uh, trying to figure out how to, how to respond to that. So have you done, I was going to say you've done that LSD, not in, in zero gravity. Was there anything specifically unique about the zero gravity besides just like fulfilling kind of like a fantasy that like made the experience different? Or was it just a really fascinating, like a really altered state and to enjoy like another extra narrowly unique experience. So, so, so I probably, if there were like a bunch of reports of people doing like psychedelics and zero gravity, I probably wouldn't actually have done it because it's one of those peak life experiences. Very few people get to do it. It's a natural high. Like you don't need to be high to enjoy something like that. In fact, probably shouldn't be for most people. It would be overwhelming. But, you know, the first time I went skydiving, the first time I went scuba diving, I took acid. It's just, it's just been this trend in my life. And, uh, you know, I kept it going with this one. But it felt particularly important this time simply because nobody had done it before. And I didn't know the next opportunity I was going to get. And, you know, I, I've had, as people, millennials, you may be Gen Z, but like, we're born at this age where there's not that much to explore until we can go to outer space. There, like it, it's hard to do new things in today's world because so much has already been done. And so finding the opportunity to be the first to do something is, is novel and it, it's cool. And uh, I, I always try to find novelty in life. I want to talk a little bit about your introduction to psychedelics. Was it, first of all, when did that happen? And second of all, was it like, you know, just hanging out with your friends in high school and like doing drugs or was it like this, like, you know, no, it was exactly out? that. Okay, it was yeah. exactly that. And so I was, I had a really rough adolescence for a long time. I thought it was just like my brain chemistry got really messed up in puberty, you know, as our brains are changing at that age. I was really depressed, frequent suicidal ideation, angry. And for a long time, I, yeah, I just thought it was like a brain chemistry issue. Now, learning a lot about neuroscience in, in the past few years and our understanding of concussions, I had actually a pretty bad concussion when I was 11 or 12. 
And it's very likely that contributed to some of my behavioral issues at that age. But it was a rough time in my life. And I was acting out a bunch. And I was on like five different psychiatric drugs. And nobody knew what to do with me. I was getting arrested, suspended, kicked out of the school. And when I was 14, being the juvenile delinquents that we were, some of my friends acquired magic mushrooms. And I had a sense of what they were. Like, I knew that they made you hallucinate, but I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. And I ate 3.5 grams, which in the world of mushrooms is, or therapeutic mushrooms is considered a macro dose, a large dose for an adult. I'm the skinny uh, little 14 year old taking it. And I just had the most transcendental. It's funny that your past two questions had me use that word. I swear I don't normally use that term, but like life altering experience where my entire outlook on life on humanity just changed in an instant. My, I was no longer able to justify my depression or my anger. And it, it just changed the way I perceived the world. And a year later, I took the same dose, with my friends, and I got this message that I should get off the psychiatric drugs that I was on. And, you know, after the first experience, I never again had suicidal ideation. And after I got off this psychiatric drugs, after the second experience, I haven't had a depressive episode in, what is it now, 16 years. So at a very young age, I understood the therapeutic medical potential of these substances. And people thought I was crazy back then when I was like, you know, evangelizing mushrooms for like becoming a better person and feeling better and curing your depression. And it took a few years, but I was born at just the right time, I guess, in that, you know, this psychedelic renaissance has taken place in the past nine, 10 years. And all this academic research, scientific studies have gone and vindicated that those beliefs that I have. So I have two questions. The, f- yeah. the first is about the first time that you did three and a half grams and it, and it changed you. And I want you to talk a little bit about like that experience, I guess, non-academically or, or just from your perspective, like what was it that happened? And then the second question is about after you've learned for the, for years and started a VC fund around psychedelics, what do you think it was that happened like physically to your brain? to help you so much? What is the, what is it that's happening? All right. Loaded questions. I'm going to try to answer both, but you know, realign me if you need to. So in that first experience, I had the first school I ever dropped out of was a uh, Hebrew school. I'm Jewish uh, by blood, but I, I dropped out of Hebrew school shortly before my bar mitzvah. And I told my parents, I was becoming a Buddhist. And we had lived in Japan for a short period when I was young because my dad's a Chinese history professor. He was teaching at Kyoto University. And I, I had always loved Buddhism. I thought it was a beautiful faith and I, I really related to it. And so when I had this psychedelic experience, I, I felt like I had achieved what Buddha described as nirvana. And I, I feel like I had achieved enlightenment. Like there are, Every 10 minutes, I would have these mind-boggling epiphanies that just shattered my my reality. Like, the level of profundity I experience, I'm not a nostalgic person, but it makes me nostalgic because I wish I could, you know, just eat a bunch of mushrooms and, and have that again, where my entire worldview was just getting radically shifted every 10 minutes and you know obviously a lot of the shit i don't remember a lot of it i can't retain but it 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 fundamentally altered who i was and it changed the entire trajectory of my life and so on this the second question i deeply believed now looking at 
the kind of neuroimaging and, and, and academic research that's gone into psychedelic studies recently, that my brain chemistry was actually altered during this experience. You know, you have these neural pathways that develop kind of like a sledding hell where you sled and the more someone sleds down that hell, the, the deeper the kind of pathway becomes. And psychedelics are kind of like a new a coat of snow, some fresh powder to oh. let you kind of realign how your neural circuitry works. Because I was so young and I was still going through adolescence, I believe that the mushrooms actually kind of helped me rewire my brain in a much more functional way, in a less manic, less angry, less sad, less self-harming way because I never experienced that again. And so there's the science to prove that somewhat. Obviously, we have not deeply studied the use of psychedelics in adolescence, although MDMA has recently been used for the first time in an academic setting on adolescence because MAPS, who focus on the commercialization and the rescheduling of MDMA, just completed their phase three trials with FDA. And as part of any phase three FDA trials with any drug, you're actually supposed to uh, do uh, a side study with adolescents. And so they did that. Uh, they used MDMA with adolescents uh, with PTSD with great success. And, I, and I, I, I'm eager to psilocybin study where the same is done for adolescents with depression or bipolar or whatever it was I had. Right. Or I think that that leads us into somewhere where I really wanted to get with you, which is the right time to take psychedelics. Like, because I often hear that you should wait till you're 25 till your brain's fully developed. But then there's another side that says, if you wait till your brain's fully developed, then you won't be able to put on that fresh coat of snow. And obviously, you know, no one should do anything that you're not, they don't want to or whatever. But like, is do you have any evidence as to that being true? Like the the well, uh, well so, so so we know that that psychedelics like LSD and, and mushrooms they prov provide that fresh coat of snow no matter how limited your neuroplasticity is. But you're right in that neuroplasticity really ends or you know ends around 20 to 30 like you know your ability to like develop new patterns of behaviors ways of thinking you've got a few prime times in your life and it, it it's like between like i think two years old and five years old or two years old and six years old and 18 so like 28 and and, and what's nice about psychedelics is that it makes your brain more neuroplastic so so Anyone can benefit from psychedelics. In fact, I think psychedelics, in many cases, are wasted on the young. You know, young people take them recreationally just to get high, to have fun with their friends, but not for the truly profound therapeutic or spiritual benefit. I happen to get both, but I don't think I may be more an exception than the rule. You know, I meet a lot of people that did psychedelics in their youth and haven't considered it since. For me, it was a much more profound life experience. And so it's a, it's a complicated answer, but I think one, we should absolutely focus on, you know, adults who are the policymakers and decision makers, the most responsible people in our society having access to these medicines. But I think we should also focus on seeing the benefits that exist for young people as well. I mean, a lot of indigenous cultures had young people taking psychedelics as a rite of passage ceremony, similar to the bar mitzvah. So you could say that my mushroom <laughs> experience was the bar mitzvah. And, and, and quite frankly, I'll likely have my children when they're ready, you know, around 13, 14, 15, when I think that are mentally there and we've had the right conversations, I'll take them to eat mushrooms. But it has to be done in the right conditions with uh, the right preparation, with the right sort of planning, understanding any sort of neurological issues that may come up, like, you know, 
such genetic predispositions towards things like schizophrenia or bipolar, but a lot more research needs to be done, generally speaking, before any such recommendations can be made. And it all needs to be done on a case-by-case basis. So what is your vision for how you'd like to see things kind of continue to play out in terms of like a legislative and investing landscape in terms of like realistically, because you're someone, right, who's like hyper convicted and kind of willing to operate in terms of like wait until there's set, like you're, you have enough conviction to act before there's quote settled science. And obviously that deserves even bigger air quotes than I gave it in terms of like what the, that recognition is worth. Yeah, but what mean, is, there's substantial evidence, but there hasn't been FDA approval yet. So yes, I, I understand where you're at. The question is, what do you want to know exactly? Sorry. <laughs> so I guess there's, there's two halves, but like, what is the, I guess, from an investment perspective, like, what are you hoping to accomplish with, with like, who, oh, with where you're investing? And, and then the legislative component. So yes. they kind of go hand in hand. So just like with maps, so our biggest investment is in maps, because what happens with the FDA is if you take a schedule one narcotic, and, or controlled substance, and you say, we believe this has a medical application, and you manage to get through all three phases of the FDA approval process. It, if the FDA approves your phase three study, that means the DEA automatically has a 45-day window to reschedule the substance so it can be medically prescribed. So for something like MDA, which is schedule one, along with heroin, cannabis, and mushrooms, uh, you have to you have to take that and move it to at least schedule three or four, which keeps it a controlled substance, but allows it to be prescribed by a doctor under the right protocols. And that is the pathway forward that I'm looking towards. I'm, and I would like for this to happen at a legislative level. I, I think these compounds that we know about, MDMA, psilocybin, LSD, very well studied substances, cannabis as well, but it's kind of separate, should just all today be rescheduled to schedule three. They can legally be prescribed by a doctor under the right conditions. I don't think companies should have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to prove their efficacy because we know their efficacy. Now, for new compounds, new psychedelic compounds, many of which we're investing in, they do need to go through the FDA approval, just like any other drug. And if you're trying to treat certain conditions for with a psychedelic that have not yet been proven in the medical literature, I think you should go through clinical trials. But rescheduling it is an imperative. I think it's going to happen with both psilocybin, mushrooms, and MDMA in the next year or two, cannabis probably within that time frame as well. But I would like to also see decriminalization of these substances, at least get these things into Schedule Two. But there's no reason why psychedelics, which are not addictive, they have no overdose potential, should be in Schedule One with crack cocaine and heroin. Just doesn't make sense. Uh, so rescheduling needs to happen. It's going to happen either through medical trials by companies or nonprofits like MAPS, which now has a for-profit arm, and or it's going to happen through legislation. And, and it may happen at the state level, but I don't want us to replicate what has happened in the cannabis world where it's this state-by-state patchwork legislation where you still have a schedule on schedule one narcotic that can't go across a state lines that that's really bothersome so we really need to think about federal changes but it's going to happen kind of one of those two ways that i mentioned and our investment thesis follows those lines we're investing in companies that we believe are going to get drugs to market either because well really because they're taking specific indications or new compounds through the FDA approval process, or we're making investments that aren't illegal today, which most of these substances are, but we invest in functional mushroom brands, 
CPG brands, software as a service companies, uh, consumer apps. We really run the gamut. It's our fun thesis is the elevation of consciousness. So take a broad view of psychedelic medicine or the potential that's brought about by it. I kind of want to ask how you, like what the framing in your mind was towards like the kind of wrapping up of the previous chapter of your career and, and transitioning into this one. Like what made you kind of feel like, you know, because obviously you have a, a very story background in crypto. You're very early to the space. You launched a kind of massive protocol called Augur. And like, that's just clearly not like the, the primary focus. So is that something you kind of like had a decisive moment that you're like, you know what, that was great. This is, this is the end of it or this kind of, and I'm going to stop that and start this. And like, it was kind of like a clean closing of one chapter, starting of another, or have the kind of psychedelics been a persistent interest the whole time. And at a certain point, you're like, you know what, I'm just going to go full time with this and let everything else kind of just be passive or let someone else take care of it. I don't, I don't really think it's either. I think it's a pretty nuanced answer and that I was ready to give my life to crypto and making it real and making it part of the zeitgeist. And I became a poster child for crypto as a result, unintentionally. And by late 2018, things changed in that it got very big, captured a lot of the world's attention. And I... I kind of lost the plot. Like I had lost control of my narrative as an entrepreneur, as an evangelist, where, you know, articles were being written about me that just weren't accurate, that, that weren't flattering. And so I, I, I kind of burned out on the evangelism. And also by that point, there were much better kind of spokespeople for the industry. Like you, you had like Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter and founder of Square, you know, talking about Boston technology and prime ministers and members of parliament and senators advocating for this tech. And so my role as an evangelist was diminished. And that was always kind of my biggest role in that industry. Obviously, I had success as an entrepreneur and as an investor, and, but I was pretty burnt out. So in 2018, I you know left Silicon Valley, moved to Miami. I had just raised my venture fund focus on the intersection of blockchain technology and social impact. And, and I invested regularly into the industry, but my perceived role as, as an advocate for the tech diminished, I think both publicly and for myself, much to my relief. And then I, you know, I wanted to do something new because my whole career had been defined by crypto. I mean, I had been just a total fuck up prior to dropping out of school and starting blockchain education network, the global nonprofit I started, and then Augur, the first DeFi app. And so I didn't just want to be a Bitcoin guy. Like I didn't want the, I didn't want that to be my identity. Like I had been excited by the social impact of, of this technology, but there was a lot about crypto. I didn't like all the scams and people losing money and just the short term short termism of it all. And so I ended up actually starting a men's skincare company while I was in Miami that I'm still the CEO of Made Man because I wanted to do something totally new and, you know, help men be their best selves and give guys confidence and, and, and destigmatize self-care. And so I did that. And, and the psychedelic thing, it happened while I was in Miami and that, you know, I knew the guys that founded MindMed, which became one of the biggest psychedelic companies, massive IPO. Because up until that point, I had actually been, ever since I first made money back in 2015, I had philanthropically been supporting the psychedelics through academic research, helping fund studies and such. But suddenly my friend showed me that you could actually potentially build a business around psychedelic madness. And, and that opened my eyes and I started seeing good angel investment deals probably at the beginning of this decade. And so by late 2021, there was a point at which I was like, oh my God, there are like so many good companies now emerging. And like I said, my, my zeal for crypto kind of never came back. And my fund was up like 5X. It was like late fall 2021. And I was like, you know what? I, we have all liquid crypto assets in our portfolio. 
I can buy out all my investors and my fund, my limited partners, and give them nearly a 5x return in just over three years. And then I can go start a psychedelic fund. That's exactly what I did. Bought out all my LPs. And then I started this fund. And within three weeks, I had a fund up and running it and deploying capital with the money raised. Uh, it was very quick, but it was just a logical extension of my advocacy and evangelism for psychedelics and an extension of the evangelism I had done in crypto and with men's self-care with my skincare company. So it kind of all bled into each other, but I never like quit crypto. I mean, I still have crypto. I, I, I still am involved in varying degrees, whether it's through board seats or investments or, you know, even occasionally speaking to the press after several year hiatus, I try to champion the best parts of crypto, but, you know, I think there are better places I can use my energy. I'm only one person. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you for helping, helping untangle that. The skincare niche is, is such an interesting one and the, the men's mental health, that also I feel like has been a topic that you kind of just consistently have a trend, right? It being, it's called like five or so years early. And again, I'm using relative to like my perception of when the topic entered the zeitgeist relative. No, you're that's... completely right. I'm always early. And the question is whether I'm ever too early. Uh, that, I don't know if that's the question, but like why, like what do you credit that to? Like, is it because of like the friend groups you're in and you just happen to like be in the right place at the right time? Like I think with the men's mental health and the men's skincare and, and with crypto, like, and kind of the follow-up question could also be, what is something that you feel like right now that you're talking about in your friend groups that is like another big topic kind of on the come up? Well, so, well I, I think it's obvious, like chat, GPT, artificial intelligence. I've been investing in AI for the past several years, knowing it was going to happen. I had a self-driving car startup built in my basement in like two months by George Hotz, Geo Hot. He's like one of the most famous hackers in the world. Like I've seen the potential of deep learning and machine learning for quite some time now. I've been telling young people who are asking me, should I get into crypto? I'm like, no, get into deep learning, machine learning. And, and the opportunities actually there now more than ever, just because it's so easy to learn. AI makes it so easy to write code. It's so easy to start a business that makes money. So I think, I mean, AI is obvious. Most good use cases, business opportunities and psychedelics requires some degree of experience or pedigree, whereas AI does not. So I definitely- speaking, right? Yeah, so definitely believe that. But I think the reason why is because, I mean, I guess I'm a futurist inherently. Like I was always interested in like what's going to happen in the future. Not like the like sci-fi, super distant future, but like the near future, like where are things going? And, you know, if you read a lot, you read magazines, you read Wired, The Economist, you pay attention to what's going on and you look at problems in the world and you, you go and Google them and see what, like, what's being done to solve this problem. You come up with answers pretty quickly. Now, the business opportunities might not be there for a while, but if you just are constantly consuming new information and going down rabbit holes and going on Wikipedia, you're going to find a lot of great stuff and you just got to figure out where you fit into that picture. And look, whether it's men's skincare or crypto, you know, I probably didn't fit in right quite perfectly. Psychedelics more so. That's kind of been the easiest thing I've ever done. But you find a problem that's important to you that needs solving. And if you think you can find a really good solution, you, you just get after it. Doesn't mean you'll be successful, but you'll have a shot. I mean, perseverance is everything in option. What are you, and this question runs the risk of just being bad and falling flat, but what are you good at and what skills did you develop like early on that you think have had an outsized impact on, you know, your career and life and happiness, et cetera? I was applying to colleges. I forget what the like, what's the, like the general application called? You may be young enough to remember the, like the, the like apps. an application. Common the app. common app. That's it. So my, my common app essay uh, was about catching food in my mouth. Uh, and the whole point of the essay was how catching, catching food in my mouth was the only thing I've ever actually naturally been good at. Everything else has been quite hard, but that's okay because I'm 
willing to work for it. So I'd say I'm not particularly good at anything. I have a high level of verbal intelligence. Like I'm, I'm good at articulating things. And, and so that was my superpower in the early days of crypto. Perhaps something I didn't har- have not harnessed enough with my skincare company, but being able to be this evangelist and be this advocate and articulate concepts that are foreign or uncomfortable to people and make them very perceptible and understandable uh, to your average Joe. And so that was a superpower, just being a communicator. It, it was my first startup. I was really able to take kind of ideas of how a system or a technology software should work and explaining that in a way that my the programmers on my team could turn into code. But yeah, I think communication, just ver- verbal communication, articulating things is probably my greatest strength. But I'm also very willing to be wrong and to fail a lot and just to not be the best at anything. I mean, I'm not the best at anything. I'm not, I'm not incredibly gifted in any particular subject matter or, or talent, but that self-awareness takes me a, a long way. One thing that I think you missed there is that you've just had a very successful investing track record as well. Like you just allocated capital effectively a number of times. What do you attribute that to? Oh, well, being willing to fail and, and, and a high risk tolerance. So I, I, I got in a lot of trouble as a kid and I crossed a lot of lines. And so I, I, I got very good as I went into my twenties of pushing the line getting co- close to it, perhaps walking the line at like a tightrope, but never going over it where, you know, pulling a Sam Bankman Freed, like, like just pushing these a bit too far, like breaking the law, doing something unethical, doing something wrong. Like I always kind of knew where that line was. And so whether it's investing or an entrepreneurship, I was willing to take calculated risks that perhaps weren't successful, but I didn't get myself into trouble because that's where a lot of young people go wrong as entrepreneurs or investors. They get into the wrong sorts of businesses, ventures that may make the money in the short term, but that don't amount to much in the long term. I've been willing to be really kind of audacious in in the bets that I make because I know that in my heart of hearts that if they're successful, they'll make the world a better place, or at least I truly believe that at that time. And so as long as your heart's in the right place and you always try to do the right thing, but you don't mind taking risk or pushing conventional societal boundaries or social norms, you, you get yourself into these nice gray areas where all the opportunity exists. Let's double click on that. What, what do you mean all the opportunity exists in the gray areas? Well, if there wasn't a gray area, you know, big businesses of the world, the seasons of entrepreneurs, the institutional investors would be making money doing it. Good luck creating a word processor or, or a new type of computer. You're not going to do it. Or even a new car company. I mean, Tesla's the first successful car startup in like, I think, 70 or 100 years since Chrysler. It was in like 1934 or yeah. 1929. It's been a long time. Like there, there's certain businesses where you, you can't just start up and create something new because there's so much incumbency and entre- entrenched interest. You look at something like crypto, which kind of bordered on something that might be illegal, like there was regulatory uncertainty or skincare, like CBG companies are just terrified of this, like Johnson and Johnson Unilever. Because, like, there's so much stigma around men taking care of their skin or psychedelics, you know, they are illegal. And so you're talking about massive gray areas where, in theory, they could be legal and the right path is charted and taken. But you don't know until you try. And institutions, the entrenched money, vested interests aren't willing to go there. And so that's, that's where all of the opportunity lies entrepreneurship is exploiting a gray area and or or, or, or you know a, a shortcoming in the system 
But even like Uber is a good example in that they kind of went up against the taxis and they were going up against city governments and lawmakers. And because of all the laws revolved around taxis, they found their gray areas. And I mean, a lot of the best startups, whether it's Airbnb or Uber or Coinbase, PayPal, the, the past couple of decades, some of their biggest spend and where they raise the most money for is for legal to just like make sure that they can pull this off and and not get shut down for regulatory reasons. And you see this happen in crypto all the time. It's people cross the line. Doesn't end well. I have a question, Lewis, if you don't go for it. One thing that's a common thread here is your heart for other people and, you know, your internal compass leading you down paths. Do you think that your experience with psychedelics has like I know it's obviously affected it, but do you think that it has enhanced it and like enhanced your ability to hear your inner self, I guess? Well, 100%. Psychedelics are more responsible for both the success and the happiness that I have in my life than any other factor by an order of magnitude. Nothing comes close to being more responsible for who I am, where I am, and how I got here than psychedelics. Just open and shut. Like, it's a, a no-brainer. But, but more interestingly is this notion of, like, the brain-gut connection, which, you know, neurologists and, and, and doctors are only beginning to understand, which is how much of what goes on in our gut affects our brain chemistry and our behavior and our moods. I think something like 80% of all serotonin that's produced in your gut. And so you talk about gut instincts, because I think that's kind of what you're talking about here. This intuition when it comes to taking risks and making bets and, you know, I'm eating mushrooms and they're sitting in my gut or you're sipping ayahuasca and the, these medicines, they're working in your gut and, and they're, and they're spreading throughout your body. And they put you much more in touch with yourself and that natural intuition. I mean, ayahuasca is a very hard medicine to explain, but it's a traditional medicine, indigenous medicine from South America that has existed for at least a millennia. And it's this miracle medicine in that people take it and, and like they just unblock trauma, like barriers mental blocks in their life and, and allows them to go to the next level and it's because everything that we need to be better is with it inside ourselves but sometimes you need to kind of activate parts of yourself that aren't easy to reach and that's what makes psychedelics so powerful they're not these silver bullets that are tools to make us better and Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, the psychedelic experiences have profoundly impacted my ability to become the person that I am for better or worse. What's something on the the other side in terms of like, you've kind of listed a lot of like, let's call them like A tier, like very, at least in some, some circles, like also name type psychedelics like LSD and ayahuasca and mushrooms. Is there anything that you encountered recently that is just, you know, not a thousand years old, but is like of an equal level of like promise or intrigue to you? Absolutely. So, well, there are a bunch of like compounds that some of our portfolio companies are developing that are showing tremendous amounts of promise. Obviously, going into those doesn't really make much sense because people, you can't really find anything about them online. But a very interesting one that, like I've had multiple calls in the past couple of months where companies are looking at the 2C family that the very famed pharmacologist and chemist Alexander Shulgin synthesized, I believe in the 80s, maybe it was the 70s. So people have probably heard of 2C. It's a popular street drug now in Miami and LA. It's pink. It's not the same thing <laughs> at all. But but 2CB, 2CA, 2CI, 2CE, there, there are several of them. Uh, relatively easy to synthesize compounds that are very psychoactive. Variety of 
different indications that they can treat, but I'm constantly being mind boggled by the new applications people are finding for them. So the 2C family is very interesting. And then DMT, which is the active ingredient in ayahuasca, but has to be synthesized for people to consume unless they're doing it through 5-MeO DMT, which is taken from a toad. DMT is fascinating. They're using that for neurodegenerative diseases now and for uh, stroke patients. And I actually, I blasted off on DMT a year and a half ago, and I got a download from God or whatever you want to call it that outlined a really complex neuroimaging study that could prove the interconnectedness of consciousness. I somehow managed to convince perhaps one of the top three neuroscience institutes on the planet, Imperial College in London, to actually turn it into a real study. And so DMT is a really interesting one that people have been experimenting with for the past, you know, 30, 40 years, but obviously already exists in our brain. It's very much responsible for our dreaming. There's people have a lot of theories around it, but it is a, a profound, I call it the God molecule. It's a profound, profound substance. There's nothing that will more quickly shatter your reality make you believe in God or a higher power or alien than, uh, than uh, DMT. <laughs> I have two questions that are completely unre- unrelated to each other. So one is about food and then the other is kind of about your friend group. So I'll, just, I'll start with the food one first. Uh, we were having a lot of discussion about, you know, very gray area things, right? You can't just go to Whole Foods and get DMT and, and certain other things that we're talking about here. Are there other aspects of like, your life and what you consume that are very important that you think are very important, so like your well-being and your mindset that are more accessible to someone who's like not willing to like kind of jump through the hoops to get some of this more frontier well, fringe stuff. Well, yeah. So, so I think, so one thing that everyone should do is, is there's all these kind of new age, well, new age isn't the right term, but like new sort of concierge doctors, there's like forward health, next health and big cities that offer all these services where you can get blood work done and get full diagnostics on your body and, and then take a genetic test and, and, and compare that to a genetic test, figure out things like the supplements that you should be taking. The, you should take a food sensitivity test and find out the foods that you should be avoiding because once again, going back to the gut health thing, you, you want your gut to be healthy and happy. You should know as much about your body and about your genealogy as possible in order to optimize your body and enhance it in the best ways. So you should be doing blood work regularly, starting in your 20s or even teens, just so you can optimize. So supplements are a huge thing. Uh, My buddy is about to start a company called love.com, which is about start testing and qualifying supplements because 80% of people that take supplements don't trust what's in them. So actually getting high quality supplements and having a supplement stack that optimizes your body's needs and make so you feel your best. I have my own supplement stack that I, I started working on a couple of years ago that has me feeling the best I felt in my entire life. And it's not anything special. There are a bunch of supplements that, you know, everyone probably should be taking, but I don't want to say this because I, I'm not qualified enough to suggest that. But you can go and find this stuff very quickly through probably online service providers, although this is something we're working on with love. But also many doctors will help you figure this out, but figuring out exactly what your body needs will get you to such a better place. And then eating the right foods and eating healthy and sleeping well. So I, I wear an aura ring and I and I track I, I track my sleep and make sure I've got good sleep hygiene and, and figuring out how much sleep I actually need each night and catching up on sleep when I haven't had enough. And, and, and then, you know, and getting in the right circadian rhythms, then, sp- then sp- spending time in nature, being in the outdoors, getting enough cardiovascular exercise. I mean, there's so many small things you can do. Like one thing I'm really bad at that I messed up with I was younger, was not getting into an exercise routine. Like I hate going to the gym and I try everything to get into it, but it's really hard. I'm about to start doing something called EMS, 
which is, you know, electromagnetic stimulation, I believe. And, and you do exercises without actually weights 20, 30 minutes. It gives you like 10 workouts in a very short period of time. And I've used things like M sculpting and, uh, and such and had great success as well. So, you know, there are shortcuts, but being healthy, just like being mindful. And there's so many great apps. There's so many wearables now where we can track our health. But if you're not healthy, you're not going to be happy. And you're probably not going to be successful. Uh, it, 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 you're not going to live a good life if you don't take care of your body. Your body should be your temple. And I am not a paragon of virtue when it comes to that by any measure. But, you know, you constantly work towards self-improvement in every aspect of your life. Physical, dietary, mental fitness. Just constantly exercising your body to be its best so you feel your best will just enhance every other aspect of your life. But if you don't take care of yourself, you're never going to get lucky. I want to ask you about your friend group, like I was mentioning. And because I know that, again, from having such an interesting backstory, right, and having like celebrity status in an industry where all of the other people's celebrity status have like a super interesting backstory. And again, kind of being in interesting places with interesting things happening. I've you know, heard you say that you were hanging out at like Coinbase headquarters when they first started. And people like Vitalik were just coming in and out and, and famous hackers. Oh, yeah, Vitalik there. always slept on my couch, yeah. <laughs> so like, what is the, is your kind of like the, the makeup of your friend group like? Is this something you're very, at all intentional about or just kind of happened because you're in this, niche percentage of society this age doing this type of things and like very intentional these, it's yeah. very intentional like i mean i did interesting things and attracted interesting people like ryan who started is starting love.com i met him right when i before i dropped out of college he started the stand for bitcoin group and my first ever venture was the blockchain education network this global nonprofit, and I, I had, I had joined the Michigan Bitcoin club. He was at the Stanford Bitcoin club. We got on a call, like the very first day I learned about these other Bitcoin clubs and we met at a conference and, you know, he came and we became good friends. And then he started an $11 billion payments company called Bolt that he's been, he was working on pretty much for the past decade. He was just on the cover of Forbes billionaires list and now he's starting love. And so, you know, you attract interesting people by doing interesting things. You know, you don't attract interesting people by being conventional. And, you know, there's a very well-known saying that, you know, you're the sum of the people you surround yourself with. So I don't surround myself with normal people. I don't know many normal people. I like to have a few in my life just so I can relate. Like I'm friends with all my same childhood friends. So I make a point to go back to my hometown, which is a small town and 20,000 people every Thanksgiving and a one or two more times a year. And I just hang out with them to ground myself. And, and you know, because I because I, I, I appreciate, you know, their their lifestyles and the lives that they live, which I, I, I actually am so happy to say are equally as fulfilling as mine, but in different ways. But if you want to have a life like mine, you have to go out and find really interesting people. And you need to surround yourselves with them. And you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. And you have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations. And once again, you kind of have to push boundaries. Like, you know, I built my career being Bitcoin's party boy and playboy. And that got invited me into a lot of VIP events, speaking at conference, dinners, nightclubs, places I had no place being that I was way too broke to be at, the way not accomplished enough to be at. But because I offered something different in, in, in the rooms that I was in, I was welcomed. And so I think being willing to be uncomfortable, to go move to new places, to try new things and to find the craziest people out there, uh, as long as they're not too crazy, is uh, the right way to do this. But I am not sure that lifestyle is for most people. Like I can't, I can't recommend my life path the most because it's hard and it can be lonely and it's challenging and you have lots of people doubting you and it's unconventional. And and you, there's always that chance that, you know, everything will go bust. And so it, it, it's, it's not for most people, but if you were to want to do what I've done, you know, that's how I do. Kyle, any, uh, any questions there? Kyle's just taking it all in and smiling. I love it. 
for someone so again not saying that they want to yeah someone not saying they want to again like aspire to you know emulate you in every way just kind of in the sense that like no definitely when have, don't do that <laughs> <laughs> when you, when you have super interesting friends right that's how you are always on the cutting edge of the future and you have opportunities to kind of invest in things early whether that's like a very literal sense of like giving capital to an idea that's super early or just like realizing that something's going to take off is it just just like what would be some very basic recommendations for someone like within where they're already moved to san francisco Uh, really like people say san francisco is dead it's not it's still the what they call in game theory the shelling point for tech and innovation and interesting people whether it's artists or creatives or entrepreneurs or developers san francisco is the number one place in the world to just be surrounded by interesting people. If you have a bit more money and a bit more well-established, you can come to San Juan here in Puerto Rico, a bunch of interesting people are like Dubai, but there are very few places in the world <sighs> where everywhere you go, you're just gonna run into someone fascinating. So you just optimize your likelihood of success by being in the right place. So I think I like, I you know, if you're in entertainment or media, perhaps, you know, LA or New York, but like, if you want to be at the cutting edge of stuff, San Francisco is your best bet if you don't have anything else. So, and be very online, like, and be reading a lot. Like I said, read The Economist, read Wired, read, go on Reddit. You know, I don't go on Reddit anymore, but I used to be on Reddit every single day, uh, you know, when I got into crypto. Uh, and you you just have to be curious and hungry, and you can't be a Great. It's like an Ellis can help put that. <laughs> I was going to come back to that. That's awesome. I'm good, Lewis. I guess one, one more question and then we can, we can wrap up. Like what questions would you have someone ask themselves for like a checklist? And again, this is, we'll probably say this in the introduction asynchronously as well, but like, you know, this is not medical advice and none of this is to be considered as like taking our recommendation or just kind of three, three guys chatting, but like when seriously do you like what questions kind of checklist if you have someone approaches you and says, I'm thinking about doing psychedelics, like I want to dip, like, what do you say? What do you say to that person? Like do your, do research, read about it, go online. There's a, a website called third wave. There's double blind. Uh, there's some microdose. There are all these platforms where you can educate yourself about these medicines. There are now lots of, you know, psychedelic practitioners who should never do it alone. You should, you know, make sure that the source of uh, of the medicine is reliable. There are all these retreats now. You should do it in a thoughtful way with someone that has experience that can guide you. You know, I was lucky in that I was very neurodivergent. And there's, who's to say that that when I was 14 and ate those 3.5 grams of munch, mushrooms, I would have had a, had a psychotic episode and tried killing myself. Like, that was dangerous. Like it wasn't smart to do that. And like, I wouldn't recommend any young person just go eat a bunch of mushrooms and see what happened. I got, I was lucky that it worked out so well for me, but that's not the right way to do things. So do your own research, understand what you're getting into. But I think a more philosophical question that one should ask themselves always until maybe retirement, which is something I plan on never doing, but, but then ask, am I comfortable? Because if you're comfortable, it means you're probably complacent. And there's a reason why it's called growing pains. You don't grow unless you're uncomfortable. And so if you want to grow, you have to put yourself in a place of discomfort. You can't, you know, if you're, you're just working for a salary to buy a nice home one day, you're probably comfortable or nothing, and you're not going to grow quite particularly quickly. You know, you have to, you, you have to be willing to make yourself uncomfortable to do the things that people will doubt if you really want to grow and push yourself. And, you know, if you want to do psychedelics, you need to do a check in with yourself. Like I've talked about all these things. It's like, are you healthy? Are you eating well? Are you happy? Is your, you know, are you in the right mindset in your life to be doing psychedelic medicine? Is that actually what you need right now? Or do you just think it's going to be a shortcut to happiness? Because if you're not actually taking care of your body and your mind, you know, the psychedelics aren't going to help. They're just going to tell you, you need to fucking work out. 
You need to start eating better. You need to start going outside and going for walks and being in nature. I mean, the psychedelics just tell you what you already know, like I said. So, you know, if, sure, if you need psychedelics to be told that, go ahead. But, but once one, do it responsibly. And two, just make sure there isn't stuff you can't already be right. doing to get yourself where you want to be because the, the, the psychedelics are only a tool. They're, they're, they're not a silver bullet. I love the distinction you keep saying, right? Medicine, you keep using the word medicine, you're not using the term drug. And I think that's a very important nuance for, for people to pick up on. Jeremy, where are you most active online for people who want to know what you're investing in, what you're thinking about, what you're up to? And in also, Instagram yeah. these days, Gonzo Gardner, you can just look up Jeremy Gardner, Twitter as well, though I tweet less these days, but it changes. Sometimes I start tweeting a bit. You can also find my bright writing on the medium. And then if you search it, pretty much if you search my name on YouTube or any podcasting platform or social media, you'll find me. I don't tick tock, but otherwise I'm, you know, fairly socially active and pretty much just like I am on this podcast, uh, pretty unrelentingly honest mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, no holds barred. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a blast. My pleasure, guys.